Hi everyone, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, thank you for being here. I hope uh, that this podcast finds you in good health and secure. Um, before we dive back in here to the essence of the Lotus Sutra, what uh, Nichiren is now going to do is is propose questions and, and then answer those questions on the basis solely of the scholarship, the the actual words of the teachings, um, to to make uh, various points about the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, and before I, I, we dive into it, I want I feel I need to restate something, perhaps in a different way. I think even though we've talked about it many times, and you have researched it on your own, I'm sure. Uh, this idea of emptiness, this idea of uh, the void, or, you know, I don't like using that. That's a Zen term. Um, here's what I want to say about it. The confusion about emptiness, the concept of emptiness, is, I think, always revolves around, does, does this bookmark exist or does it not exist? And it's, the tendency is to think that Buddhism is trying to teach us that this doesn't really exist. And that's simply not the case. That's a misunderstanding of Buddhism. And so I, I can sense right away many of you are just taking a breath. Oh, good. Okay. Because... That's always been floating in my mind as a, maybe this is mystical too. And I want to assure you, Buddhism is not mystical. And I'm going to attempt, and since I picked it up, let's use this bookmark as an example. What is Buddhism saying when Nagarjuna goes through great exercises of proof that this is empty. Not that it does not exist, but that it is empty. And I will remind you once again, my constant refrain, Buddhism is about the mind, not the body but the emergent property from this apparatus that is the mind, perception, attitude, intent. How does the mind work and provide you and I an experience of life? So in order to do this, Buddhism spends a lot of time separating this from the mind's perception of this. And this is the critical thing to always keep in mind. <clears throat> we grow up, we are born into, our birth itself manifests in physicality. But as you and I know from science, physicality is the primary illusion of samsara, of this existence. I'm not saying 
that this is an illusion, this bookmark. What I'm saying is our perception, our mind's idea of this bookmark is an illusion. All the way down to the electron, beyond the electron. Because as we know from science, the laws of electromagnetism provide that no two mists, clouds of electrical charge can occupy the same time space. And so they resist one another, right? In the case where they are, like, like take two magnets, two strong magnets, and try to put the north poles of those two magnets together. It's going to be near impossible. It's going to be at some point, just there's so much resistance, they won't go together. And yet if you flip one of those, uh, one of those two magnets around, it's impossible to keep them apart at a certain distance. This is how molecules form. Atoms and electrons with certain electromagnetic properties can't resist but come together and others simply won't allow you in. And that, my friends, is our samsaric perception, our experience of not being able to put my finger through this book or through this bookmark, that it makes it feel solid. Terms we've come up with to describe this experience, solid, can't put my finger through it. But atomically speaking, Subatomically speaking, I should be able to just put my finger right through this, this bookmark, because there's far more space between the particles, the descriptions of energies, than there is the containers, the waves, the properties of energies. But when you start to understand that particles aren't bookmarks, that particles are fields of energies, just as my fingers are, then there's ample space for my fingers to just go through this bookmark without ever touching or running into anything, except for the electric magnetic forces. When you look between your two magnets as they won't go together, no matter how hard you look, you can't see anything prohibiting them. They're magnetic forces that are keeping them apart. You see? And when you hit this, what you're hitting is the electromagnetic energies of what constitutes the particles of the bookmark and my finger, not wanting to let pass. So, why do I get all scientific on you? Because I want to give you a samsaric physical example of what Buddhism is saying. Buddhism isn't saying, Nagarjuna isn't saying, this bookmark does not exist. What he's saying is our mental conception and experience of this bookmark is our primary judgment tool, assemblage, attachment. We're attached to the idea that this bookmark is solid and it exists. And everything we derive from that experience emotionally, I like this bookmark. I want to use this bookmark. This bookmark is mine, not yours. 
If I let you borrow this bookmark, I will be anxious about its return to me. See, that's what Buddhism is dealing with. And Buddhism says all of that drama around this bookmark is what's causing you anxiety, fear, stress, false joy. All of those emotions, those sufferings, are based on this being a real, permanent, static thing that can be owned or lost. But if we use our minds, that same mind, and teach that mind that without our samsaric experience of this electromagnetic interference, we can, with our minds, understand that this is just an arrangement of very few particles, energies that are constantly manifesting and degrading and disappearing, that this very thing is made up of predominantly, I don't know the percentage, 99.9% no thing that what I'm hanging on to as a descriptor or an experience of this area as a bookmark is a temporary thing, a temporary thing that I've latched onto and made permanent. That the fact of the matter is I'm talking about space. I'm talking about something that's really empty of being itself a thing. The thing of it is my relationship with it. And if I can understand that that relationship is a contrived thing, a constructed thing. Yes, it's constructed of energies and an experience and a visual cues and all of that. Not saying it doesn't, nor was Nagarjuna saying there's no bookmark. What he was saying is the idea of bookmark, cardboard, lacquer, whatever, permanence, ownership, loss, is a ridiculous misperception of the fact that all of this is just a constant manifestation of not altogether much at all. That it's empty of a self nature. That it's empty of ownership or loss or difference. That there's so little that defines this as separate from everything around it that it's laughable that we have so much invested of our identity in it being. Because it's just a fleeting manifestation of processes. It's an effort, in other words, to analyze how our mind perceives and how that very perception is the source of our problematic, our human condition. And that if we would take the time to perceive that this and everything else in the universe is just this condition with certain tendencies manifesting, that we can, I can use this bookmark I can use it as a real quote unquote thing all the while though, in my mind, understanding that this is just 
it's a contrivance. It's a, it's something that's not ultimately real. Real in the sense that it never goes away or that it makes itself or that it has a self-existence proponent. It exists provisionally for my samsaric experience, just like all life. Every dust particle in the universe, though it may be a hundred billion years in existence, it's still not permanent. It still arises and we can toy with it for a while. And even our percept, our, your mind, when we expire this body, this apparatus, this part of the apparatus, which is the whole universe, when our body ceases to live this process that we're instantiating, then that emergent property we call mind also will disappear. Then will this exist to that mind? Because there is no mind. Then does this exist? If it does, it'll only be in another mind, in somebody else's perception, and that won't be the same bookmark. It'll be their experience of this arrangement of atoms. Do you see how Buddhism dissects the local mind versus the Buddha mind? The Buddha mind is the entire universe. The local Buddha-ness is our experience of it. Mind, attitude, intent. So emptiness is a rhetorical way of training the mind to understand that our attachments to thingness and therefore all of our various constructions of ownership, laws, so on and so forth, are empty they're based on no thing perception of thing not being an ultimate truth but just a handy <clears throat> surviving this life as a, a being truth it's a temporary situation a constructed one you follow so, in that regard, let's keep that in mind as we continue the essence of the Lotus Sutra. Because something interesting is going to happen, and I'm not sure if we're going to hit it right away. It may have to wait till the next video. I'm not sure how far into this, but it is coming, and all of this will make sense. Question. For whom did the Buddha of many treasures verify the truth of Shakyamuni's Buddha's preaching? Buddhas in manifestation all over the universe praise his preaching, and bodhisattvas emerge from under the ground to prove the eternity of his life, Buddha's life, Buddha-ness. See, there's still this confusion between Shakyamuni, the man, versus Shakyamuni, the Buddha experience yeah answer people understand that they were for those who were living during the buddha's lifetime so the question again for whom did the buddha of many treasures verify the truth of shakyamuni buddha's preaching we understand the buddha of many treasures is a personage validating shakyamuni's teachings of buddhaness that be that as it may people at that time understand and now i guess uh, understand that those were for those living during the buddha's lifetime 
but I, Nitrin, do not agree with them. Shariputra and Mad Madgalyayana are honored as the foremost in wisdom and in superhuman power, respectively, today, in our time. When we see the past, however, Shariputra was Golden Dragon Buddha and Shibuti was Blue Dragon Buddha. As for the future, Shariputra will become flower-like Buddha. When the Lotus Sutra was expounded on Mount Sacred Eagle, Shariputra was a great Bodhisattva who instantly rid himself of three delusions of greed, anger, and, <clears throat> and stupidity. In the original state, he was an old bodhisattva who had attained bodhisattvahood in heart, in his mind, but showed himself in the guise of a shravaka. He adopted the samsaric identity of a student, a man of learning. Great bodhisattvas such as Manjushri and Maitreya attained Buddhahood in the past, but show themselves in the guise of bodhisattvas at present. So again, this is talking about the stories, the expedient means, how these personages describe certain states of mind. The king of the Brahma heaven, Indra, sun god, moon god, and four heavenly kings, again, all personages that existed long ago, had been great saints even before Shakyamuni Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. There it is. These have been devices humans have created in order to personify certain aspects of mental experience that they couldn't explain. And so they saw them as outside themselves. Like we see our bodies that's outside of our, or our, our minds outside of our bodies, our minds outside of our brain. Because they're emergent properties, not built in. That's the way we perceive them, right? Think back to my example about energy, though. Our experience of this body, these fingers, these eyeglasses, they're empty. So there's far less distance that, or, or a descriptor identification between mind and body now, if you think that way, yeah? Furthermore, they understood immediately all teachings of the four tastes and the four teachings expounded before the Lotus Sutra. There were no unwise men in the Buddha's lifetime whose doubts needed to be answered by proof of the Buddha of many treasures, the praise of many Buddhas all over the universe, and the appearance of bodhisattvas from under the ground. There were no reasons for them to do so. Everybody before the Lotus Sutra perfectly understood that they were learning the way their mind works within their samsaric environment. They didn't have the insight of the essential teachings of the Lotus Sutra, not yet. So everything prior to that, they were learning, right? And they understood it. I understood numbers. I understood adding and subtracting numbers. I understood division and multiplication. It may have taken a while, but I got there. I understood algebra, right? So on and so forth. Therefore, looking at the Lotus Sutra, we find that the Buddha says, quote, many people hate it, the Lotus Sutra, with jealousy, even in my lifetime, right? We've talked about that before. Because it presented something that for them, for those pre-Lotus Sutra students, busted apart their whole worldview. In other words, they really weren't getting the depth of the provisional teachings. They were just understanding the provisional teachings based on their samsaric experience. Just as they remain attached to Shakyamuni 
the man instead of what he had achieved, Buddhaness. Hmm. Needless to say, more people will do so after my extinction, Shakyamuni said. This, this is a human nature, right? In the teacher of the Dharma chapter, and, quote, in order to spread the Lotus Sutra for a long time in this world, end quote, in the Beholding the Stupa of Treasures chapter, the Treasure Tower chapter, Considering these statements, the Lotus Sutra is expounded for those of us living in the latter age of degeneration. Because it's a prediction of us, yeah? Therefore, referring to this period, Grandmaster Tendai says, quote, up to the fifth 500-year period after the Buddha's extinction, Shakyamuni Buddha's extinction, people receive the merit of the wonderful Dharma from afar. Grandmaster Dengyo also speaks of this period, quote, the ages of the true Dharma and the semblance Dharma have almost passed and the latter age of degeneration is shortly coming, end quote. The latter age of degeneration is coming shortly means that the time when he lived was not the time for the Lotus Sutra to spread, but the latter age of degeneration is. <clears throat> We've gone over this many times, right? Question, what is the secret dharma that Nagarjuna, Vasubandhu, Tendai, and Dengyo did not spread during 2,000 and some years after the Buddha's extinction? What were they holding back then? What part of Shakyamuni's teachings were they not telling us? Answer, they are the Hanzun, most venerable one, and Kaidan, their precept platform of the essential section, and the five character O Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. Now, this is what I wanted to get to with my earlier analogy. We hear these words too many times, and they seem abstract. And we, we learn them and we go, okay, those are the three great secrets, right? The three treasures. The Hanzon, the Kaidan, and the Odaimoku. But what does that mean? In terms of emptiness, reality, Buddha-ness. Well, the Hanzon, which I remind you is the Go Hanzon, the ultimate Hanzon, the Hanzon is the Dharma body of Buddha. It is the Buddha-ness that you and I experience as the life engine of this universe. The universe, the entirety of this apparatus of life conceived in the mind is the Dharma realization, the Dharma Buddha body, because body is a reference in samsaric language that not only means this body, but the body of thought, the body of understanding, of conceptual knowledge, that body. That's the Honzon. That's the most venerable one. The most venerable because it is the goal of living this life fully manifested of all its potential with that perceptive insight and experience when everything is one, when the process is not different for this bookmark than it is for you or the moon, or the entire universe, that we're all cosmic energies manifest of infinite potentials. That's a one, the venerable one, the, the universal one is the goal of this practice. This is why it's venerated. 
That's the Honzon. The Kaidan, this platform, is, in other words, this entire apparatus. This place which contains that truth. In the symbolism of the altar, it's the Butsudan. So you're saying, well, does that make the mandala the Honzon? No. Nope. What is the Honzon then? What is the Gohonzon? It's the fifth uh, or the five character Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. Because we recognize the duality of our lives in Samsara that we live and perceive a physical world, but that with knowledge, with our minds, we can transcend the limitations and the impositions of the emotional states of this physical manifest body Still Buddha, but by perception, the Dharma of that manifested body, the way that we instantiate the most venerable one, that Honzon, is through our invocation of, our action of, remember action and energy, karma, by invoking the reward body, chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, we transcend, we release our conceptions, our contrivances of this bookmark, not by getting rid of the bookmark, but by understanding its existence and the existence of all things in life as a process of Honzon. And so this mandala is our great treasure tower, our, our insight, our tool of magnification to go Honzon in our minds and experience that reward of the Honzon. Apparatus, manifest body, action, invocation, effort, reward, go Honzon. manifesting the ultimate truth, Honzon, of the whole process. There it is, the three great treasures. Guide, uh, question, why did they not spread during the ages of the true Dharma and the semblance Dharma? Why, why now? Answer, if they had spread them during those times, the teachings of Hinayana and the expedient Mahayana and theoretical section of the Lotus Sutra would have disappeared. And this would be a great loss. Why? Because everybody in Samsara, every mind that is emergent from this physical process needs introduction to, needs training to. If you make enlightenment immediately available to people, then you end up with people who may not understand seeking to invoke something they may not understand. And then when you try to communicate with them about this amazing reward body they don't they completely are cut off from it because now they're just doing something rote 
like singing the alphabet, but they never learn how to make words or sentences with it. Or if they learn to make words or sentence, their idea of an alphabet or language and the creation of it are irrelevant and they can't be bothered. And so you cut them off in a way from attainment, which you don't want to do. You always want to be able to fall back on the scholarship because of this dual relationship that we have in samsara with the earthbound physical perceptive mind and the liberated more uh, conceptual mind of the entire process to have one without the other is the same conundrum do you see Question, why do you try to spread them in the latter age of degeneration if they could destroy Buddhism? So he got the point. If you taught it before this latter age, you would eviscerate Buddhism from within because then there would be no value, no learned process to lead to this awakening So why are you doing it now if that's the result? Answer, it is because in the latter age of degeneration, all Buddhist teachings, both Hinayana and Mahayana, expedient and true Mahayana, and exoteric and esoteric teachings remain. But no one attains Buddhahood by practicing them. Ah, so that's another dimension of this. Those earlier teachings for people of those capacities, of those eras, some people attained enlightenment. So if you came along and said, just chant Namo Myoho Gekyo, then nobody would practice any of those others. And there would be no learning for the vast majority that didn't attain Buddhahood through those teachings. But now, today, in this age of degeneration, or the loss of the teachings, all of those previous teachings, nobody attains enlightenment through them. They learn a lot about their minds and Buddhism, but they never attain. They never awaken their Buddha mind. People in this Saha world all commit the sin of slandering the true Dharma. In this, in this adverse condition, only the five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo should be forced on them in order to plant the seed of Buddhahood. Forced on them. In other words, chanting is a new avenue to be shown to people who are practicing all of these earlier teachings and not achieving awakening, enlightenment, not experiencing Buddha, and clue them in. This is our bodhisattva opportunity. Yes, you've learned a lot, but you haven't started chanting Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. This is what will turn all of that learning you've been doing into actualization, realization, self-manifesting Buddha. For instance, never despising Bodhisattva preached teachings of the Lotus Sutra for self-conceited priests and was persecuted. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing. Right? My disciples are in a favorable condition able to put conviction in the five characters to attain Buddhahood, but many others in Japan are not following these other provisional teachings or corruptions of provisional teachings, worse even. Therefore, we have to forcibly spread the five characters of Myoho Renge and Kyo among them to sow the seeds of Buddhahood. We have to correct the situation because these people are ignorant of the ultimate teachings of self-enlightenment. 
Question, why do you disregard the whole of the Lotus Sutra or even its abridgment, emphasizing only its essence? Answer, Huan Chang disregarded an, an abridgment and preferred the whole. He expanded the 40 facels of the Great Wisdom Sutra into 600 facels. Remember when we were talking about the perfection of wisdom sutras in 8,000 8, lines or 80,000 lines on and on, right? Kumarajiva preferred an abridgment to the whole. He got to the essence. He condensed a thousand facels of the great wisdom discourse into a hundred facels. I, Nichiren, disregard both an abridgment and the whole and prefer the essence. What is the quintessential portion of this teaching that contains the whole? It is the five characters of Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, and Kyo, which superior practice Bodhisattva, there's that identification again, Jogyo, transmitted from Shakyamuni Buddha, the Bodhisattvas of the earth. It is said that Chao Bang Yuan of Qin selected a fine horse by removing an unhealthy yellow horse, and that when Qi, Dao Lin lectured on sutras, he disregarded details, preferring an outline. The five characters of Myo, Ho, Renge, and Kyo are the precious doctrine preached by Shakyamuni Buddha when he entered the stupa of treasures sitting next to the Buddha of many treasures. The very imagery in, in calligraphy of this mandala. Buddhas in manifestation gathered together from all over the universe. The Buddha then invoked bodhisattvas from underground, chose the essence of the Lotus Sutra and expounded it for us people in the latter age of degeneration. Pay attention to the word invoked. Bodhisattvas didn't come out of the ground like stalks or plants and manifest in this story of the Lotus Sutra. Buddha invoked them. We are children of the process of life, invoked by it to express it, experience it. Right? We are bodhisattvas of the earth. There should be no doubt about its merit in the world, the merit of this teaching. Question, are there any omens for this Dharma to spread in this world? Again, you know, this is how humans think. They want mystical proofs instead of just experiencing what's before them. Answer, the Lotus Sutra says, quote, their true appearance, so on and so forth, such causes and effects of all things and phenomena are interrelated. Right? This is the discussion of all the ten factors and appearances and same thing we talk about all the time. Energy, potential, formations. There's no end to that discussion. It's not about the thingness of that discussion. It's about the mental ideation of that process. Tendai says, quote, when a spider spins a web, there will be a happy event. When the conditions are set, then the events will follow. The tendencies will manifest. When a magpie chatters, a visitor will come. As there is an omen for such a minor event, even more so, Will there be an omen for such a big event as spreading the Dharma? It's a matter of doing, 
actualizing, being. Everything is in a momentum. Everything is movement. There is no static. So if you have an expectation of some thing, some event, then you simply need to set the conditions, which is this universe, for a potential to manifest. This is how life works. If so, are there any such omens now? Are you just... Are you not paying attention? Answer. And I need to... Oof. Maybe I need to take a break. No, I'll read this answer and then we'll be done for today. We had a severe earthquake in the first year of Shoka era, a huge comet in the first year of the Bunei era, and various strange phenomena in the sky and natural calamities on earth following them. These are all omens for the Lotus Soup Church to spread. In other words, look at the world around us today. Watch the news. Watch YouTube. Watch any commentators on the situations in Brazil, in Yemen, in Russia, in Ukraine, in the United States, in the Senate. Look at the condition of man all over the world. In Africa, Australia, all the various struggles going on. And you could very easily say at this point in history that all of those struggles are based on ego. Identifying. I'm white, you're not. I'm Aborigines, you have wronged me. You have oil, I want it. I can make a bigger bomb to scare you into worshiping me. These are all relationships and they're all driven by selfness. Not true selfness, but this bookmark selfness. This ideation of physical supremacy, power, ego. Because power, financial fortitude, strength, superiority, all of those egotistical terms cannot manifest without their subjects, their slaves, their poverty, their weaknesses, right? You can't have strength without weakness. If you feel weak, it's because you've let yourself be overwhelmed by a perception of other as strength. Coming back to what I started this video with, if you understand the emptiness of all of that, that contrivance of all of that, you can understand it, see it, perceive it, very differently. Removing the aspect of fear from it or gain from it. Simply seeing it as part of the vicissitudes of human ego. That doesn't make it not exist. See why it's important to understand this? What it does is it makes it not as powerful an influence on your mind, on your reaction, so that you can think clearly how to move beyond it, how to not be affected by it. That is reaching into your Gohans on your Buddha mind to see it as it truly is instead of as it is temporarily affecting you. Seven, 29, or innumerable calamities listed in the Sutra of the Benevolent King, for instance, and various calamities mentioned in such sutras as the Sutra of the Golden Splendor, 
Splendor, the Sutra of the Great Assembly, the Guardian Sutra, and the Medicine Master Sutra have already happened. In other words, this isn't news. This isn't a new and different thing. These are just different manifestations of the same dramas. Only the big disaster of the appearance of the two, three, four, or five sons predicted in the Sutra of the Benevolent King has not actually taken place. I can't imagine what that actually would look like. Because I'm sure they're not stars, sons, but maybe that's a prediction of, uh, you know, when, when human ego finally has the enormous avarice and stupidity to just set off nuclear war. <sighs> I grew up with that in the 80s, that, that existential fear and crisis. I don't think it's ever left me. However, according to residents on Sado Island, where he spent some time, two nuns appeared to the west at around 4 p.m. on the 20th third day of the first month or three suns according to others it is also said that two venuses appeared side by side only three inches apart to the east on the fifth of the second month are they not most extraordinary phenomena that ever happened in japan the obo shonran chapter of the sutra of the golden splendor predicts that when a strange meteor falls or two suns appear simultaneously, foreign enemies will attack the land, arousing panic among the people and ruining the country. It is said that the Heroic Valor Sutra, two suns and two moons will appear. In the Medicine Master Sutra, there will be an extraordinary eclipse of the sun and moon. In the Sutra of the Golden Splendor, a comet will appear often, Two suns will appear at the same time, or an eclipse will happen often. In the Sutra of the Great Assembly, when Buddhism declines, the sun and moon will lose their brightness. And in the Sutra of Benevolent King, the sun and moon will lose their regular orbits. Seasons will be reversed. A red sun and a black sun will appear. Two, three, four, five suns will appear simultaneously. Darkness will prevail due to the eclipse of the sun, and one, two, three, or four, or five rings will surround the sun. These extraordinary phenomena of the sun and moon are the worst of seven, twenty-nine, or numerous calamities mentioned in the Sutra of the Benevolent Kings. Do you see that all of these stories, expedient means, are hyperbole to explain to us humans that the events in our environment reflect our personal experience. It's not that there'll be five rings around the sun, like it's become some kind of Saturn or whatever. It's that these great immense forces around us, the life of the universe, look up, understand that your life is not just this tiny thing amongst all of that, but that you are inextricable from all of that. And that those happenings, whether they're conjured or actual, are evidence of your state of mind. Your potential. And if things look bad, it may just be because that's the energy you're influencing your environment with. And if you want things to look better, you need to get your mind right. And that is what Nietzsche is pointing to. The essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra is about simply that. This was the original goal of Siddhartha Gautama when he witnessed sufferings of birth, sickness, old age, death. He thought... These things, they happen. They're real. But the way people have so many struggles with those things, 
negative emotions about those things, sadness about those things, the way they cling to those things, fear, anxieties, stress about those things. There's got to be a way that this life process of birth, sickness, old age, and death doesn't cause so much mental strife. There's got to be a way. And the answer is, yeah. Perceive anew with a new state of mind. All of those same things without the attendant clinging to permanence, to non-change. Right? It's a cliche. People don't like change. But you should, because nothing stays the same ever. You should be basking in change. You should embrace and love change. How do I do that? Namu myo renge kyo. Open that mind of basking in change. Seeing and realizing the beauty of change. Stop trying to hang on and put anchors down in the movement of time. That's death. If you stop moving through time, aren't you dead? And yet that's what we try to adhere to in samsaric mindset. Yeah. All right. One, two more questions and we'll be through with the essence of the Lotus Sutra. But I think it's worth taking the time. At least I feel it is. If, uh, if I w have awakened or opened a window or a door for you, let me know in the comments. If you think I'm out of my mind, let me know in the comments. If you have something to add, please. That's what the comments are for. Let me know what you think. In the meantime, keep your practice strong. I appreciate you guys immensely. These videos allow me to take my practice into a much more um, tangible place so I can express and experience my own Buddha-ness as much as possible, my Bodhisattva-ness as much as possible. I too am a student along with you. So no matter how many times I read these things or talk about them, I'm constantly learning and sharing that as much as I can. <sighs> On that note, don't forget to download the podcast. Don't forget threefoldlotus.com. Lots of free info there. If there's something else I need to add to that long list of basic Buddhist concepts, let me know. Uh, because, uh, you know, that, that, that site is always evolving. I'm always putting more there. So I, I haven't, I don't believe I've covered 84,000 teachings, but I've certainly covered, you know, uh, well over 60, I believe. So it's a start. Let me know what else I should talk about. Namo myo renge kyo. Be kind to yourself. Watch your health. Watch your diet. Take care. And I will see you in the next one. All right? Bye for now.